All right, we're ready for section 9.2 on function notation and linear functions. So in this section, we're going to look at uh, function notation and evaluating functions using function notation. And we'll also uh, be looking at uh, linear functions and kind of some review of graphing linear functions and analyzing linear functions. So um, first of all, function notation something you're probably all a little bit familiar with but it's a good review when a function f is defined with a rule or an equation using x and y for the independent and dependent variables we say that y is a function of x to emphasize that y depends on x we use this notation instead of using the y we use an f of x it's called function notation again it's read as f of x. That of does not mean multiplication. Some people get confused about that, but um, because of can mean multiplication in other instances in mathematics, parentheses can mean multiplication in other contexts in mathematics, but in this context as a function this means f of x, which means it's really y, but it's written as a function of x. All right. Um, using function notation, number two here, we're given a couple functions. So you see f of x equals this expression and g of x, so that means uh, we're just using a different letter. Um, you can use about whatever letter you want. f and g are used very commonly to represent functions, um, but we have an expression for g of x. Okay? Basically, we've replaced y with f of x, and we replaced y with g of x. And it's kind of nice because if we had y in both places, and I said, well, let's refer to y. Um, you wouldn't know which y I, were ta I was talking about, would you? Um, but now, since we replaced y with f of x in this equation, and y with g of x in this equation, I could say, let's look at the g function, and you would know it's not the f function. All right. So first thing we're going to do is we're going to do a little bit of evaluating. Um, this is kind of plug and chug. Um, we're asked to find f of negative 3. What that means is we're going to plug negative 3 in this expression for x. Okay? So f of negative 3, we use the f function, would be negative 3 squared plus 6 times negative 3 plus 4. Now don't forget, when you square a negative, you better get a positive, right? And so this becomes 9. 6 times negative 3 is negative 18. And then we have plus 4. And so you just have to do some arithmetic. 9 plus negative 18 plus 4. Well, I know 9 plus negative 18 is negative 9, plus 4 would be negative 5, right? So f of negative 3 equals negative 5. Now, another benefit of using this notation is when you get to the end and present your answer, uh, you don't forget where you started. This basically tells us when x is negative 3, y is negative 5. Okay. If we just had a y there, and it's not so obvious in this instance, but if we just had a y there, we might have forgotten where we started. And so we don't know what the ordered pair is. Um, with a simple equation like this, it's not a big deal. We could always look back up here. But if uh, and I know from experience in grad school, or you're solving these huge equations that take a few pages, you may forget where you started. And so this is a nice reminder is that we started with x is negative 3. We end up with y is negative 5. All right, so let's look at the next one. What if we want to find f of r? Hmm, that's silly. We just plug r in for x, right? So f of r would equal r squared plus 6r plus 4. Not really anything else we can do. We're just replacing x with r. So that's a very simple one, right? Okay, now let's look at the next one. We're asked to find g of r plus 2. So when you have an expression that's not just another variable, you may have to do some simplification. So let's plug in r plus 2 for x, and this time we're asked to do it in the g function, right? So we're finding g of r plus 2. That means we're going to plug r plus 2 in for x. So we have 3 times r plus 2 
plus 1. Now this answer here would be correct, but uh, let's do a little simplifying so we can combine like terms and make it look a little bit nicer. Distribute the 3, we get 3r plus 6, and then we still have the plus 1 out here. And so g of r plus 2 is equal to 3r, and 6 plus 1 is 7, so 3r plus 7. All right, so that's plugging in some, that's just using evaluating functions using um, function notation. Now, the next thing we're going to do is uh, we're going to extend this a little bit. We're given a function in different forms, different functions in different forms. So as we talked about in 9.1, a function could be represented by an equation, which we're looking at really in this section, and we did a little bit in the last section. Um, it could be represented by a set of ordered pairs. It could be represented by a mapping diagram. It could be represented by a graph. Okay, So those are four basic ways we can represent functions. Now we can evaluate functions um, regardless of what form it's in. If it's an equation, we're asked to find f of negative 1 here um, for each of these. So that's maybe the easiest one because we can plug each other, right? And plug in negative 1 for x. 2 times negative 1 squared minus a negative 1. Anytime it's a negative, and I purposely gave examples with negatives here, make sure you put it in parentheses. Um, that way you won't have errors with squaring or um, errors like we might have here if we forget to do minus a negative. Um, so don't forget your negatives. All right, so let's see. f of negative 1 then. We could plug this all in our calculator if we wanted to, or we could do it mentally. Negative 1 squared is positive 1. 1 times 2 is 2, right? And then we have minus a negative 1, which is really plus 1. So this is 3. So f of negative 1 is equal to 3. Maybe I'll put a box around it. Easy enough. The next one, we're given a set of ordered pairs. It has to find f of negative 1. So the f function is defined by this set of ordered pairs. And when what this is asking really is when x is negative 1, what is y? And we can find the point where x is negative 1. In that point, y is 6. So f of negative 1 would be 6. So that should be even easier than the last one. It's just more conceptual and less um, algebraic manipulation, right? Um, so when x is negative 1, y is 6. All right, the next one, we have a mapping diagram. When x is negative 1, x is part of the domain, right? y, that gets paired with 5. y is 5. All right, so that's pretty easy. This one's 5, and I'll put a box around this one, too. So some people look at this and say, well, this really isn't a function, is it? Because 1 goes to 5 and negative 1 goes to 5. But remember, that's okay for a function. Um, where we would have problems if it, is if negative 1 went to both 5 and something else, like 4, for instance. It's okay to have the same y mapped with two different x's. It's not okay for a function to have the same x mapped with two different y's. That's a concept that some people have trouble wrapping their mind around, so I like to reiterate it a few times as we work through this um, chapter here. Everybody okay with that? Hope so. All right, next one. We want to find f of negative 1 from a graph. We basically find out where x is negative 1 and find the corresponding y value on the graph. So when is x negative 1? It looks like right here, right? What's the y value at that point? It's 0, right? Which means f of negative 1 is 0. You might ask yourself, is this a function? Of course it is. It passes the vertical line test, right? Any vertical line we would draw would only hit one point at most. In fact, this one, I think it would always hit one point. But anyway, answer here, 0. That's the y value when x is negative 1. Now I could ask you to find other values of the function on these. I just gave one example, but for instance in part b, if I asked you what f of 3 was, hopefully you would say that's 5. On 
part C here, if I said what's f of 0, hopefully you'd say that's 4. On this guy here, if I said what's f of 0, hopefully you'd say the y value is 2, f of 0 would be 2. So you could do a lot of examples um, with these same particular functions if you wanted to. Now I'm going to go ahead and say so we only have two left on the, in this section, so I'm going to go ahead and flip the page over and uh, do this last example in 9.2. And this is really should be review, right? We're asked to graph each linear function, give the domain and range. Now we don't have function notation here. These are lines, and I think they're functions. So um, what we're adding here is domain and range, right? So we could graph this line just as we graphed the lines in the past. I'm going to make a t-chart for this one. Uh, maybe I'll do this down here since we have plenty of room. Um, so we could plug, oh, let's, let's use intercepts if it's possible. We'll plug 0 in for x. So we have negative y equals negative 2, which means y would be 2, right? Let's plug 0 in for y. We'd have 2x equals negative 2. That means x would be negative 1. That gives us two points, 0, 2, uh, negative 1, 0. So those are our intercepts, and that's enough to get a line. We could graph it and use my straight edge, my old Office Max card. Um, hopefully no, nobody steals my identification from my Office Max card. No, I think I'll be okay. Um, you can use my Office Max rewards if you want. I don't think I have any right now anyway. All right. There we go. So there's our line. Is it a function? Clearly it is, right? It passes the vertical line test. Um, what's the domain and range? Maybe I'll do the capital D, capital R. This goes forever left, forever right, so that means our domain is negative infinity to infinity. It also goes down forever and up forever, so our range also negative infinity to infinity. All right, so that's a linear function. Um, we know it's a function because it passes the vertical line test. So let's look at the next one. Hopefully you remember if you have y equals some number, what kind of line is that? Think to yourself in your head. Say it out loud. Say it to your cat. Say it to your dog. Say it to your mom. I don't know who you want to say it to, but scream it from the rooftops or the confines of your room or wherever you are. This is a horizontal line, right? Again, if you weren't sure, you could always make a t-chart and then say, well, I know y is 2. If I need at least two points, we're y is 2. We don't care what x is. x could be anything. I could use 0. I could use, I don't know, 5. Or whatever number you want for x because we're not given any restrictions on x. So the point at 0, 2 would be right here. Point at 5, 2 would be here. You could use any other x values you wanted to, as long as y is 5. And then we're going to graph this line. It is a horizontal line. Is a horizontal line a function? Of course it is. It passes the vertical line test, right? Any vertical line we would draw would go through only one point. Um, all right, so this is a function. That's great. Um, Domain and range. This is a little tricky, but I think we can handle it. Domain, all the x values. Well, this goes left forever and right forever. So every x value is represented negative infinity to infinity. Range, does it go down forever and up forever? No, it does not. The only y value that ever shows up on this line is 2. So your range is actually just the number 2. Use a little set symbol the only thing in the range. So we have our domain and range. Now, that makes, it may make you wonder, those of you who are critical thinkers may be thinking to yourself, well, what about vertical lines? Are they functions? Hmm. So maybe down below here, I'll look at just one other thing. Let's say we have a coordinate plane. That's pretty ugly, but let's say we have a vertical line. Maybe it's, maybe this is 3. Let's say we have x equals 3. That's a vertical line, right? Definitely not a function. It would not pass the vertical line test because we could draw a vertical line through that vertical line that would hit multiple points. Is it a relation? Yes, it is a relation. We could still find domain and range, um, but it's not a function. So this would be a relation not a function 
And we could still find domain and range of this relation. The domain, there's only one x value, right? 3 is the only x value on this entire line. So we have a set with just 3 in it. The range, since it goes down forever and up forever, would be negative infinity to infinity. All right, so that's it for this section. I'm going to stop the video, and we'll see you in Chapter 10.